Good afternoon, everyone. It's, I'm Elaine Orvine. I'm the President and CEO of the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers. And on behalf of CAFC, on behalf of our National FASD Steering Committee, uh, and on behalf of our wonderful hosts from PEI, I'd like to welcome everyone to, uh, to this uh, National FASD Symposium. Just before I provide just a little bit of information on CAFC and our National Screening Toolkit, I was going to ask my colleague, Doug Maynard, to come up and just give us a little bit of the technical intro of what we're going to be doing this afternoon. Many of you, of course, are here with us uh, in the room, and we have um, upwards of about 75 people or so who are going to be joining us via webinar. So we've got colleagues literally from coast to coast um, with us this afternoon. So Doug, if you could come up for a few minutes. Thanks, Elaine. Uh, yeah, so many of you may be familiar with some of the FASD webinars that, that we've been putting on over the last about 12 months or so. This is, uh, I think, episode six in, in a series on uh, CAFC's FASD screening work, uh, work in screening tools for FASD. Um, this is actually the first time that we've attempted to combine a, one of these webinars with an in-person meeting. So uh, fortunately, the technical issues were relatively easy to solve. Now we just have to figure out some way to get a nice coordinated discussion going. Um, so obviously, uh, Dr. McLeod will be in the room facilitating and moderating the session here. And he'll also be uh, facilitating and moderating, with my help, uh, the, the questions and discussion from the remote audience. And uh, our audience ranges, uh, as Elaine said, it's about 60 or 70 people. From, from across the country. Uh, so they'll be, for those of you who are listening out in the, uh, across the country, uh, hopefully you can uh, hear the audio well enough. Uh, our test editor showed it was good here, so if you are, are having any issues, you can type those questions into the question box and I'll try and deal with them here. And if you do have any questions, uh, you can type those questions, uh, questions for the presenters, questions related to the content, uh, comments, uh, anything that you want to contribute to the discussion. Uh, you can type those into the question box. You should see a panel on the right-hand side of your screen somewhere. Uh, and you, you can just type your questions in there and we'll see them as they come up. And we'll be taking breaks in between the presenters, et cetera, where, where we may, I'm hearing a no. We will not be taking questions between presenters. We are taking all the questions at the end. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's a good point. So if you do have questions for clarification, et cetera, specific to the content, you feel free to type them in as they come to mind, and we will see a list uh, of the questions, and our moderators will be keeping an eye on them and, and answer them if appropriate, or if they're relevant to the discussion at the end, we will hold them to the end. So as I, as I said, just feel free to type the questions in as, as you think of them as you're listening to the various presenters. Uh, there were a couple questions that I got by e received by email uh, leading up to this about the length of the webinar. Typically, our webinars are an hour and a half. Uh, this one is, 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 was advertised as much longer. I think it was advertised as 1 to 5 o'clock. Uh, it, it, the, the broadcasted webinar won't go quite that long, um, but we will, uh, we will be ending the broadcast portion of the webinar at about 3.30, and I think that probably the people out in the remote audience are breathing a sigh of relief and sitting in front of their computers for four hours would be a little, a little trying, I think. Uh, so I think that's the only uh, instructions I need to give to the remote audience, so I'm going to hand it back over to Elaine. Thanks, Doug. And again, a very, very warm welcome to everyone. What we're going to be focused on this afternoon, and, and I emphasize the word we, because we really need your involvement, your input on what we're going to, what we've entitled this symposium as the place for meconium within our national screening toolkit. And, uh, and of course, that's what we're going to uh, focus on in terms of um, our, uh, our discussions this afternoon. There we go. Okay. I thought for some of you who may not be familiar with CAFC, it really would be perhaps a good place to start to just share a little bit of background information about the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers. CAFC was co-founded in 1968 by the leaders of the children's hospitals across our country. And over the subsequent three decades, we're all very, very much aware that child health care organizations certainly underwent some very fundamental changes to the infrastructure and the way in which we provide access and services to health care for our children, youth, and their families. 
to, to better respond to those ongoing and emerging challenges related to the shift in the way our healthcare system, in fact, is working across the country. CAFC incorporated in 2001 to really be able to support the many member organizations that belong to, to our association. Today, CAFC is very proud to support over 50 member organizations representing multidisciplinary health professionals that provide health service delivery to our children, youth, and families. Um, and our, our membership is represented within all of the children's hospitals in the country, community hospitals, rehabilitation centers, as well as home care provider agencies. Our mission is to support our members and partner organizations through education, research, quality improvement initiatives that improve health service delivery for Canada's children and youth. And of course, the work that we are all doing in the area of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder certainly falls well within that commitment and mission. How do we do this? We do this by advocating for the unique character and importance of the health of our children and youth, by identifying and responding to emerging issues and trends that impact our communities. And FASD is certainly something that falls within that as well. Building a community of practice to share research, knowledge, and expertise, just like we're doing here today. Building a strategic partnership, building strategic partnerships and facilitating collaboration, as well as leveraging opportunities to advance health service priorities, again, through our education research and um, uh, community uh, programs. Lots and lots of information for you on the CAFC website, beginning with our National Screening Toolkit, which is what today is going to be all about. A little bit of background on how did we get started and, and where, where in fact did, did, our, did our work begin. Everyone in this room is very much aware, of course, that on March, in March of 2005, the Canadian guidelines for diagnosis were published in CMAJ. The development of the guidelines was facilitated by our colleagues at the Public Health Agency of Canada as well as Health Canada. However, when the guidelines were published, we realized, I know everyone realizes, that there were no valid and reliable screening tools. Um, to in fact look at the consistent screening of our children and youth, limiting the, our ability of um, healthcare allied professionals and families working with children with behavioral and learning disabilities to consistently screen for FASD. Our collaboration began in the spring of 2007 and has really engaged hundreds of individuals from across Canada. Very quickly, the principles of our process. The toolkit was developed using a set of established criteria to evaluate the identified tools in terms of sensitivity, specificity, positive and negative predictive values, as well as for their practical applicability to the following ease of use, accessibility, cost, expertise required, cultural appropriateness, and the interpretation of results. I want to acknowledge our steering committee who have truly led this work in consultation with many researchers and collaborators from coast to coast. And I would also like to recognize our partners within the Public Health Agency of Canada and First Nations Inuit Health Branch, Health Canada. To give you a very quick snapshot, these are the five tools that are currently within our National Screening Toolkit, and I want to stress that this is a work in progress. That was the intent when we launched in, in uh, last October 2010, and the intent is to keep, again, the work is ongoing and in development, and again, a big part of what this afternoon is all about and hearing from you uh, specific to our meconium testing. We have had, as Doug uh, mentioned, a very successful KT and education program that was implemented in uh, January of 2011. And of course, um, as we have, this is the sixth 
in our series of uh, webinars that began on March the 7th. All that are listed for you um, from uh, March 7th through through to June 30th are available on CAFC's Knowledge Exchange Network. There are podcasts available for you um, to in fact tune into at any point. And today's webinar and symposium will in fact um, be applied to our Knowledge Exchange Network as well shortly after today's symposium. My last slide I just want to show you the KT strategy and outreach just from March to June of this year. We have had over 5,000 individuals participating in the webinars and our Knowledge Exchange Network. So the outreach has been really exciting and very important and I think it's just an example of, of the need for this resource and the work that we're doing collaboratively. Again, a very, very warm welcome to all. I'd like to ask my colleague and uh, uh, Holly McKay from the Public Health Agency of Canada just to come up and say uh, a few words. Thanks very much, Elaine and Doug, and the uh, CAFC Steering Committee, esteemed guests, and all the folks that are here in PEI. I think everybody listening across Canada should be here with us. It's absolutely gorgeous, and we're very happy to be here. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of an overview of uh, some of the work that the Public Health Agency does uh, that this screening tool fits into. Um, so basically, we started uh, years ago looking at various issues and we said we don't really know what health providers think or know about FASD. So we did a national study. One of the authors is here, Dr. Suzanne Tapp and Dr. Margaret Clark. And we did a, a study of health professionals who told us various things. They said that you need diagnostic tools, you need screen tools, we need more information, we need to have uh, training, and uh, we need to have it designed just for us. Uh, we also had various stakeholder meetings, national meetings, and we looked first of all at the diagnostic guidelines, and again, in the guidelines, it was very clear that we, did, we had screening tools, but we didn't know which ones were valid, and we didn't know, and not everybody was using the same one. So there was a lot of variability there. And then there was a lot of discussion as well on alcohol policy. So what should, be, what should we be working on? You know, what are the, the areas that uh, have, have to do with alcohol policy? And certainly the outcome of FASD is one of them. We also um, meet regularly with partnerships and give workshops at conferences. And the parliamentary committees intergovernmental groups and, and groups within Health Canada and the Government of Canada have all suggested that screening tools are something that are, are much needed on the front lines. And as well, this comes up a lot in symposia and workshops across the country. So this is our, our FASD National Strategic Projects Fund. So we get an annual allocation for contribution agreements of just about 1.5 million. And our goal is to assist organizations who have the capacity to enhance and build on existing activities and to create capacity where none exists. Um, our funds are national in scope, they're time limited, and they support the FASD initiative as well as the public health agency and health portfolio objectives, obviously. So these are some of the projects that started um, back in 2007 and 8. And I will say that projects in general are on all focusing on an unmet need. Um, they're, they're based on the best evidence that's, that's possible. So a, a stringent systematic literature review is always done. And they're also built on consensus across Canada. And I think we have in this country the capacity to build consensus and to, to realize that we can say we've achieved it. They also are designed to reach Canadians from coast to coast to coast. So it's not centered in one part of the country, but our role is to have this available across the country. 
And the final thing is that all of these committees uh, associated with all of these projects have advisory groups. And several of the people in this audience, I'm sure, certainly here at PEI, but across the country wear multiple hats where they work with us on a variety of projects. And this is a very key component to making sure that we're not duplicating efforts, that we're getting the information out to where people need them. So in addition to the CASI project we're talking about today, we also uh, work with the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada. I'm doing a little show and tell in the room here. This is the clinical, clinical consensus guidelines that were just published in 2010. And these and frontline providers who are in healthcare settings can no longer say, well, I don't really know what to say what, to a woman about alcohol use. This helps them to do that. The University of Toronto Faculty of Medicine also developed an evidence-based training program for frontline providers. And these are two of the tools that are used in that kit. And though these um, training situations have happened all across the country, and especially in areas that normally don't have access to training on substance abuse, problematic substance use, rather. And it does include uh, a lot of information in that SD. The other is Memorial University, and they're collaborating with the BC Center of Excellence for Women's Health. And um, they are actually have an online free course. They're updating it now. So it's going to be going live shortly. We don't know exactly when. But it, we've had one module, and this would be module the second sort of module of that. So that's happening here in Atlantic, at least it's in Newfoundland. And these projects that I'm going to now have all started this past year. And we're focusing on areas that we know the federal government has a role, and that is to look at population-based kinds of activities. The first one it is a little different. It's on developing an evaluation framework for, for those in communities who are trying to evaluate, do their programs or projects, uh, are they successful, and if so, why? Are they effective? Um, we hear back from both the people in communities and funders that an evalu a good evaluation of, of the projects is needed before uh, moving to the next step perhaps or refunding something, etc. So we've been told over and over again that, we, that these skills are, are needed. So we're trying to develop those. And the next projects all have to do with prevalence. Um, again, that's a federal government uh, kind of population-based activity. Nobody else is going to do it if we're not going to do it. So, and it's very important because I think it comes down to, well, we don't really know how many people are affected. We don't really know what the numbers are. So we're trying to develop these in models and get started looking at some ways to, to calculate this. Uh, the first one is the Tri-Province, um, so the, sorry, the Child Welfare Institute, Children's Aid Society of Toronto are the sponsors, and they're working with so that's Ontario, Manitoba, and Alberta are working together to look at the understanding of costs and services for children and youth in foster and adoptive care. So they're looking at a number of different issues associated with that. Uh, cost is one of them, but also um, what are the issues of the kids that are in care and certainly transitioning out of care. So. Um, that is a very interesting project that's linked to some work done originally by Doc. Okay, I'm, I'm supposed to quit now. Okay, Government of Manitoba is also looking at um, screening or tools to assess the population of kids in grade two. So that's underway. The government of Yukon is looking at adult corrections. Again, looking at the prevalence case management options. And the Neural Development Network is looking at common data tools. So those are some of the things that we're working on. And they all sort of fit together with the screening tools. It's one big component of it. So thank you. Lots of, lots of information, important information, and the materials that Holly referred to. There's, she's brought lots with her, um, so please pick them up as you either come in or leave. Without any further ado, it is truly my pleasure to hand over the afternoon to our moderator, Dr. Stuart McLeod. Stuart is one of CAFC's National Steering Committee 
members and leaders and has had a tremendous commitment and, and involvement in the work thus far. So Stuart, over to you with great thanks. Uh, thanks Elaine very much and uh, it's great uh, to see so many of you here in the room and to know that we've got a uh, large crowd across the country who are also l listening into this, what I think is a very important discussion. Uh, uh, my uh, my uh, history of involvement with FASD goes back quite a long way. I'm looking at Jim Bryan at the back of the room. Uh, Jim and I both, well, almost 40 years ago, were working for the uh, the Alcohol and Addiction uh, Research Foundation in, uh, in Toronto, and uh, that was probably the beginnings of interest in FASD and in Canada. Certainly there were many researchers there who realized that this was a, an important public health uh, issue. But uh, uh, I'm not going to uh, say anything more about my myself or my interest. I think we need to get on to the uh, uh, the panel. We, we, we're really very fortunate to have assembled uh, an excellent uh, panel who are going to cover, uh, I think, if, at least three of the most uh, controversial aspects of this. One, the, the epidemiology uh, of FASD. Uh, secondly, the uh, how to use meconium testing as a population tool. Uh, uh, and uh, thirdly, uh, we're going to come around to the ethical and legal considerations, which really are in some ways the thorniest issues uh, sur surrounding meconium testing. So uh, without uh, any delay, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on introduction uh, of our speakers. You've got brief bias on the, uh, the table, so they'll forgive me if I'm, uh, I'm brief. But uh, uh, the first uh, speaker is uh, Suzanne Kopp from the University of uh, Calgary. And Suzanne is going to try to enlighten us about the, the eternal debate about how common uh, FASD and its various manifestations uh, may be. And are we ready? We are. Yeah, ready. Great. Thank you very much, everybody. It's, I'm delighted to be here today and appreciate very much the invitation to talk a little bit about the epidemiology of FASD. I can just stop right now and tell you that bullet two, population-based global estimates of FASD don't exist. So we could just speed it up and I can um, <laughs> get to the, cut to the chase, but maybe I'll try and shed a little bit more light on what we do know and what we would like to know as we move forward in this area. So by way of an outline, I think it's clear that we need to talk about what the definition of FAS and FASD are because that will influence what we measure and then how we know what the rates are. I'll talk a little bit about what we know in Canada, internationally, and then talk about this concept of alcohol exposure in utero and what that means for understanding FAS and FASD. So as you know, FASD refers to a range of effects that occur as a consequence of prenatal alcohol exposure. That's a given. You can't get FAS or FASD if there isn't prenatal alcohol exposure. The Institute of Medicine, the Canadian guidelines, and the four-digit diagnostic code are all also clear that you need growth deficiency, facial anomalies, CNS abnormalities, and confirmation of alcohol exposure if you're going to put somebody in the FAS category or FASD range. So how do we calculate incidence then? Well, incidence is the number per thousand live births and refers to new cases that occur as a proportion of that population. So therefore, to calculate an incident rate, we need to know what the defined population is and the criteria for diagnosis. If we want to understand prevalence, again, it's the number per thousand that we report, and it includes all new and existing cases. When we understand prevalence, we can better direct our resources towards support and, and intervention for those most at risk, because prevalence rates can change across time, across community, and across, and across region. Prevalence rates are more commonly reported than incidence rates because we think they're a little bit easier to get our head around. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. So when is FAS or FASD a new case? Because that would help you determine the incidence. Well, FAS can exist theoretically in a fetus, and so it's difficult to know exactly when this would begin. FAS during certain months of pregnancy might be higher than a prevalence rate because you could have spontaneous abortion that then influences the counting 
of an FAS incidence. The diagnosis of FAS or FASD could also take place much later than the onset of the condition, particularly when facial anomalies are not present, or particularly when you're trying to look at incidence rates as a consequence of a live birth outcome, and it's difficult to detect. So all of these factors influence how we calculate the rates and how accurate we think our rates might be. In addition, it clearly depends on the methods we use to collect the data. So when we consider what is FAS or FASD, we have to really be mindful that different studies and different groups use different diagnostic definitions. The broader the definition, the higher the rates are going to be. The narrower the definition, the lower the rates are going to be. What the true rate is depends on how we understand the definition and the denominator. And this is why what I'm going to say next looks like porridge. <laughs> uh, so anyway, all of these definitions influence what we understand in terms of what we're measuring. And then, of course, it's in terms of what we're trying to intervene and treat. So something to think about, though, is if you have low incidence or prevalence rates in a community or in a population or in a country, it could mean that your prevention, ex your prevention efforts are really working. But it could also mean that there's low identification of the disease. And I think from everybody here and from reading the literature, lots of people would think that this is probably true in both instances. In some areas, prevention is working. In other contexts, we have low identification of the disease. Because people have different ways of studying FAS and FASD, incidence rates and prevalence rates are going to be variable. So I will tell you what the rates are, by the way, but you just should know this before you get into um, what the numbers really mean, because then it helps you interpret the numbers. There's different methods of calculating or ascertaining incidence and prevalence rates, and they all have their associated advantages and disadvantages. Passive surveillance is quite commonly used, and it makes use of existing resources, is fairly cost efficient, and fairly easy to conduct. So for example, you might go through all the birth records in your community or in your province to look at how many of the boxes related to prenatal alcohol exposure were checked off on the prenatal form. And then you might say, okay, based on this denominator, this is what we could potentially expect in terms of fetal alcohol exposure. However, as you might also be aware, that relies on non-specialist physicians completing the form in a category that may or may not be of importance to them. And so the accuracy of the information might be less, um, less accurate than you would like if you're particularly interested in this condition. In clinic-based studies, we have more control over the information, and we often have better information about the maternal history. We can have a large number of pregnancies in these kind of clinic-based studies. And that allows us to calculate a different rate based on the exposure and the outcome. The disadvantage of this is it relies on self-selection bias for those women who choose to have their care at that clinic. And you can imagine that in some cases, you could have underestimates of prevalence or incidence because all of the women are very aware of alcohol use during pregnancy, so it looks like there's zero exposure. Or you could have a public clinic in an informed area where rates of exposure seem to be very high and that again would bias the estimates from what we would consider the true population estimate. So when you look at clinic-based studies you always have to understand the generalizability of the findings in the context of the clientele that it was gathered from. In active case ascertainment, which is what Philip May has done in some of his work, we try to diagnose infants, children, or young people at a suitable age when we think the di diagnosis can be fairly accurately made and we're more likely to uncover children with FAS. This has wide representation and is one of the most commonly used methods to get population estimates that I'm aware of today. The challenge with this active case ascertainment is that it's fairly costly. In addition, you need the community support of those beyond the healthcare sector if you're going to assess children for these kind of um, challenges, these kind of learning and behavior problems, and of course you need buy-in from the family if you're going to really understand some true estimate of what prenatal alcohol exposure could have looked like. So this is often done in communities or in populations 
where people suspect that there is something to measure in the first place. So there's already a, an elevated sense of concern that would draw people's attention to wanting to understand this population better. So just to sum up, um, subpopulations and generalizability are really important in this area. Generalizing rates across study or across communities is particularly difficult due to variations in subpopulations and methodologies in how we report and diagnose FAS and FASD, and in the prevalence and detection of alcohol use. So rates in subpopulations should not be used to be generalized to populations in general. That was a bad sentence, but you get what I mean. You can't take a small group of people from one area and assume that what you found there is the same all across your province or Canada. So, um, again, I'll just short-circuit this and say there's actually no official statistics that I'm aware of that I could find that tell us what the incidence and prevalence of FAS and FASD are in Canada. That being said, in 2004, both ADAC and Health Canada published the rates you see on this slide here. They estimate 1 to 3 per 1,000 live births as FAS and 9 per 1,000 as FASD. Interestingly, though, we couldn't find the citation for these estimates, and so after much digging and conversation, it's probably that these estimates are based on U.S. estimates and those other estimates from the Western world. But that didn't deter us from moving on and trying to figure out what exactly was happening. So now I'm going to talk about some of these smaller studies that are carried out in subpopulations and with different research questions. So in a British Columbia study, and you'll notice this, the dates on this slide are fairly long ago, 1972. Using their birth defects registry data, they estimated the rate of FAS at 0.25 per 1,000 up to 4.7 per 1,000 in their community. In Saskatchewan, based on clinical data and contacting clinicians that were likely to be in contact with children with FAS, they estimated the incidence at 0.589 per 1,000. In a smaller study, where the authors acknowledge these rates shouldn't be used and be generalized beyond this community, Thompson General Hospital estimated 7.2 per thousand live births as the incidence of FAS. All of these authors acknowledge the limitations of their data. One is that it's a birth defects registry and was everything actually coded in that registry in BC? In Saskatchewan, this was based on known cases, so those where physicians might already have had an understanding of who was affected. And in Thompson General Hospital, it's a small sample and mostly an Aboriginal population, and the children were assessed at age two. Prevalence rates in Canada, also among children in care, have been estimated at 110 per thousand. And you'll notice now we're moving into rates of children in subpopulations that have often come in contact with the government agency or government system. Canadian Correction System, those already diagnosed with FAS when they come into the system, 0.087. In contrast to some quite carefully done work in British Columbia where youth that were remanded into care were assessed for a full year, where their rates are highlighted on the slide here and are much higher than the other ones noted on the other side of the slide. When we look at Aboriginal children in different communities, you'll see there's a range of prevalence rates noted here. Again, different methods of data collection and different methods of recruiting children and families into an assessment protocol. The ranges are highlighted. So, in summary, this is what I think is going on in Canada. I'm fairly confident that the lower limits reported on the slide, we're not going to find much that's lower than that. But looking at all of this and looking at some of the challenges in interpreting the data, I'm not quite sure what the upper limits would be. Philip May and Ernest Abel have done some great work on um, FASD in other countries, and this is really compiling a lot of their data. I just want you to note the range on this slide, and also to note at the bottom there are other countries that report that there is no FAS in those countries. And we don't know if that's that there's no FAS or there's no measurement or ascertainment of FAS. So the global summary, according to the work that we have, again needs to be interpreted with caution. So there's gaps. There's gaps in rates. The statistics are often dated. I would caution anybody that takes a rate from 1972 and says that might be what we're seeing now 
to be very careful about that because our culture has changed, our drinking patterns have changed, and our healthcare system has changed. And one of the things we might want to look at going forward is how have drinking patterns changed currently that might influence the rates that we can expect to see going forward. So in the future, prevention is working or is there low identification of the disease? And hopefully we can use baseline data collected around prevalence and incidence to help us understand if our prevention efforts are working. That's the future. One of the other opportunities with FAS, though, is to understand that it has to be related to alcohol exposure in utero. And I think we'll hear more about this today and tomorrow because I think it's fairly well stated that it is not a linear relationship. So we have to have information on the exposure if we're really going to understand how incidence and prevalence rates can be interpreted and acted on. Some of the work that we've done suggests that almost half of first-time mothers report drinking some alcohol before they know they're pregnant. In, among that group of women, 73% report drinking at low-risk patterns, so less than nine drinks per week and no binge drinking. 22% report a binge episode prior to pregnancy recognition, and about 5% report high-risk drinking and no binge. The good news, in this, good news about this is that it aligns quite nicely with the work that Joey's going to talk about later on the Gray Bruce study, where they also identify that about 2.5% of women screen positive for fatty acid ethyl esters. And again, we don't know among that population, though, what the pattern of drinking was, and I think we'll talk more about that over the day. So the challenge of alcohol exposure in utero, and again, there's some nice work published by Joey and others about twin pregnancies and trying to understand this differential dose response effect between the mother's biology, infant outcomes, current life circumstances, nutrition, fetal susceptibility, and patterns of alcohol use, all of which are really important if we're going to be providing a label to a child that could influence uh, influence the care that they receive or the patterns of care that they receive across the life course. So FAS, FASD and alcohol exposure in utero, I think this is the million dollar question that we need to be thinking about as we begin our screening. We did ask women about screening in some of our studies. We asked 1,500 women actually whether or not they thought that universal screening was a good thing. And indeed the majority did think that universal screening would be fine if a positive screen resulted in the mother and baby staying together and mom and baby receiving the help that they needed. If either mother or baby were to be removed from each other, the likelihood of women wanting to participate in screening is greatly diminished. Essentially, screening needs to make a difference. So who are we talking about? Prevalence and incidence rates are very helpful for understanding populations at risk. But I think it's really important as we move forward to recognize that we are really treating individuals and that the mother-infant dyad is the unit that we are working with and that women do not come into pregnancy and then start drinking. And so you can read the Why Mary poem, which highlights, I think, that women who are at risk of an alcohol-exposed pregnancy can often be identified by grade two, three, four, five, certainly by high school or by university. Our highest risk women are often in contact with our systems of care. And so there's an opportunity when we think about screening for infants to also think about what are we doing to identify those most likely to benefit from our interventions and our screening. So some final thoughts. The influence of alcohol exposure is nonlinear. I think that's important. Prevalence and incidence help us assess the influence of interventions. Assessment calls for intervention. And women at risk can often be identified prior to pregnancy. Thank you. Thanks, Suzanne, very much. Uh, I'll just ask Doug, uh, the, those of you who are online across the uh, country, if there are things that you're not clear about, you can, you can certainly uh, send questions uh, through to us, and we will get clarifications right away. But otherwise, we'd like to have a more fulsome discussion at the at the end of the presentation. So I don't think there are any questions there at the moment. So Suzanne, you've obviously been very very clear. But but Suzanne has framed very nicely the uh, the central question here. We we honestly don't know what the incidence and prevalence of of this condition is. 
its in its various forms, and it's very hard to make sense of the policy issues and, until you have better information on that. And that's really one of the attractions of meconium testing as a tool, which may help us to do that. So now we're going to uh, we're going to have a series of three presentations about uh, the use of the meconium test. Uh, and the first of these is going to be made by Joey Guerrieri. Uh, Joey uh, has been uh, at uh, Mother Risk in Toronto for several years and, uh, and uh, has a great deal of experience with the meconium test in Grey Bruce and other jurisdictions. So, Thank you very much, Stuart. And I'd like to thank uh, CAPSI for inviting me to, uh, to give this talk. Um, all right, so I'm going to discuss what meconium testing is, how it's used in current practice, and also how it's used to determine things like prevalence, not of FASD, but of prenatal alcohol exposure. I'll begin by describing meconium. Meconium is uh, the, basically the stool that's developed during the prenatal period in the fetal intestine. So it's a complex matrix made up of a number of products that are going through the fetal digestive tract during the uh, latter six months of pregnancy. And uh, the timing of formation of meconium is estimated at about 12 weeks, about 12 or 13 weeks. It's at this time that fetal swallowing begins and amniotic fluid begins to cycle through uh, the developing fetus. So with meconium testing, we do have an exclusion of first trimester, hist first trimester history. Um, now meconium will pick up a large number of compounds that the fetus is exposed to. So drugs can be detected in the meconium as well as alcohol metabolites, uh, which I'll be speaking about in detail today. Uh, but things that were present prior to 12 weeks of pregnancy will not be detected in meconium. So for all intents and purposes, when we're discussing what meconium tells us, it's really giving us information on the last uh, six months of pregnancy. It has some advantages over blood and urine as a toxicological matrix. Uh, in one sense, it's a discarded material, and it's relatively uh, large in volume and easy to collect. Uh, if you can try and imagine, it would be it is quite challenging to, to collect a urine sample from a one-day-old child. Uh, you don't get a lot, and in the, from the lab perspective, it's difficult to work with. You usually get it in cotton, and you have to extract the urine out. You can't get them to pee into a cup. You can try, but... <laughs> Um, and the collection is relatively easy and non-invasive. Uh, the reason we test meconium, in particular uh, in an FASD context, is due to the importance of having evidence of prenatal exposure to alcohol. Uh, only about 1 in 10 alcohol-affected children will have the physical features of the disease, the distinctive craniofacial abnormalities. The other 90% will look relatively normal may not exhibit any intrauterine growth restriction. Therefore, we need to know that there was significant prenatal exposure to alcohol. Um, another reason we look at meconium is due to the specifics of alcohol metabolism. Uh, one standard drink contains about 14 grams of alcohol. Um, this would be one bottle of beer, one glass of wine, or one shot of liquor. Now, our bodies eliminate alcohol relatively uniformly uh, compared to other, other drugs uh, at about half a drink per hour. So someone who's had a binge episode, if they drank five drinks in a sitting, their urine can be negative for alcohol after about 12 hours. So this is an extremely short window of detection to actually be able to pick up uh, alcohol exposure. So routinely available urine alcohol testing for newborns uh, exhibits very low sensitivity if you're looking at a laboratory method for determining uh, alcohol exposure. This is a diagram describing the different pathways of ethanol metabolism. Uh, the majority of ethanol is metabolized um, through what we call oxidative pathways through two enzymes, alcohol dehydrogenase or ADH and aldehyde dehydrogenase. And it's converted ultimately to carbon dioxide and water. Um, that's about 85% of the alcohol in our body. A small amount is eliminated unchanged in breath, sweat, and urine. And this is what traditionally is detected roadside tests and in, in urine and blood tests. There are another set of markers that are alcohol that has been attached to uh, endogenous 
compounds circulating in the body, such as free fatty acids or, for example, glucuronic acid. Um, and these metabolites, what we'll be talking about today is fatty acid ethyl esters, um, will stick around longer and can incorporate into meconium and are relatively stable. So they stick around uh, and we see them long after the alcohol itself has left the body. I'm going to give you some background on the validation of FAE in meconium so uh, you can understand what a positive test means. And then I'll describe some uh, studies that have been done and the current clinical use of FAE meconium testing. Uh, in the late 90s, um, studies began to be published correlating fatty acid ethyl esters in meconium with gestational alcohol consumption. Um, so what we know is that as uh, women's prenatal alcohol exposure increases, the presence and concentration of fatty acid ethyl esters in the newborn's meconium increases. In 2003, a study was published by the Mother Roots Group looking at our positive cutoff for FAEs. Our bodies produce alcohol naturally uh, as a byproduct of digestion. So very small amounts of FAE are naturally present in our body um, and can be detected in a subset of newborn meconium. So what we determined is that uh, levels below 2 nanomoles per gram can be expected in a non-alcohol exposed newborn. So this is what we call positive cutoff to determine alcohol exposure. The, uh, the same uh, Daphne Chan published a, another paper a year later showing that the FAEs that we find in meconium actually don't cross the placenta. So they are from alcohol that was metabolized in the fetus, not alcohol that was metabolized in the mother, and then the FAE crossed into the fetus. This was done by placental perfusion studies. Um, Dr. Jim Bryan at uh, Queen's University showed there's a negative correlation between meconium FAE concentrations and fetal brain weight in guinea pig pups exposed to alcohol prenatally. So in an animal model, FAE is actually a marker of significant brain injury in a prenatal exposure context. Several human studies have been uh, published showing uh, measurable deficits uh, in children alcohol exposed that correlated with their FAE scoring on their meconium when it was tested. Um, so a number, uh, a series of, of these types of studies have been published. Uh, so we do know that when a meconium sample is positive for FAE, that that child is a higher risk of having some form of neurodevelopmental delay. What we know right now is the positive predictive value. If a child tests positive for FAE, we don't know what proportion will actually get an FASD diagnosis. That study is currently underway um, at the hospital for sick children. So in summary, when a, when a mother drinks, the alcohol passes through the placenta, uh, it gets into the fetal system and is converted into FAEs, which are then detectable in the meconium. I'll talk a little bit about using this method as a uh, research tool. So we looked at fetal alcohol exposure incidents in the region of Grey Bruce, Ontario, which is in southwestern Ontario. Um, this study was published in 2008. Uh, Dr. Tuff referred to it. We found a 2.5% positive fetal exposure rate to alcohol. Now, um, compared to the passive surveillance that's currently routine care in Ontario, uh, only 0.5% of mothers actually admitted to any alcohol or drug use in pregnancy from that thin population. So we detected a five-fold higher rate of significant alcohol exposure. Now this was an anonymous screening. Two follow-up studies were done. The high-risk mothers from this uh, region were diverted to London, Ontario. So we did a, an anonymous screening study, so the same model in the high-risk births from that region. And then we followed that up with a non-anonymous opt-in uh, model of screening program where we got informed consent and asked women to participate with follow-up services offered through the public health unit of great groups. This is uh, briefly the opt-in screening model. Women came in, we identified them from that region, uh, and they consented or refused. The meconium was collected, and if it was positive, they were, the children were entered into a six-year follow-up program with the public health unit. 
um, and then they were then referred to existing programs and services in the region to address whatever may have arisen. There was a significant impact of informed consent requirement on participation. You'll see in the first two studies we had over 90% participation. This is anonymous, and the main goal of these studies was to determine prevalence. We also had a 10 times higher rate of fetal alcohol exposure in the high-risk births. There's almost 30% compared to 3% in the general population of that region. When we got informed consent, the prevalence rate dropped significantly, or rather the incidence of, of fetal alcohol exposure, to about 3%. Uh, and the participation went from 90 to about 75 percent. So with a 20 percent drop in participation, we actually had a tenfold drop in incidence. So a lot of the children that were alcohol exposed were missed. It's important to note in this study, we had about 60 women participating for this opt-in screening. Uh, out of the small number of children that tested positive, uh, we one of them had early issues identified at six months of age. So being involved in this program actually allowed us to mobilize them to speech and language services uh, within 14 months of birth um, to ensure and uh, this mom has an ongoing relationship with the public health nurse. So right now, um, clinically, meconium is commonly used to establish prenatal exposure to drugs of abuse and alcohol in Canada and in many hospitals across Canada. The testing is currently targeted. It's based on suspicion of prenatal exposure. Meconium samples do have to be collected ideally within 24 hours of birth as the risk of false positives increases after 24 hours. It's a relatively novel matrix, so it's not available in routine hospital labs for testing and the samples must, must be shipped out. But this is a common requirement for any specialized test. Consent is not required when a physician orders the test. A physician may order any test deemed necessary in the care of a child. Uh, and consent is also not required for similar tests involving some sort of mother-to-child transmission of either a drug or a, a, or a biological agent, such as HIV. Uh, neonatal urine toxicology is commonly done looking at neonatal urine for cocaine or opioids or amphetamines. And the primary difference is that with meconium, you have a longer window of detection going back up to six months prior to pregnancy, um, which gives you more sensitivity. If you have a signal for alcohol exposure, you don't want to rule it out if you can't support it with an alcohol urine test. So when we look at the role of FAE in a multifaceted approach to FASD screening, uh, it's important to keep in mind effective maternal interview techniques should be part of this type of plan. Uh, formal interviews increase reporting at a pretty low cost, but you do have a high risk of false negatives. The sensitivity depends heavily on how comfortable that woman is with the healthcare system. Um, following interviews, you want to do appropriate laboratory testing. You don't want to close the book if you ask a mom, did you drink, and she said no, but you've had a signal either from uh, social services or from a family member or some sort of clinical suspicion that there may be prenatal alcohol use. This is just an example screening model. Um, if you have clinical, this is targeted. So this is following clinical suspicion of prenatal alcohol exposure. Uh, if you get a self-report, then you can mobilize services. If you don't get a self-report, you'd move on to either routine lab and then on to meconium testing, which would give you a wider window of detection. So that's all for the presentation. I'd like to thank Dr. Korn, my supervisor, Dr. Lynn, the medical officer of health in Great Bruce, and Dr. Ingrid Go and, and Irene Zellner, whose research I showed. Thank you. Another uh, important part of the uh, description of the environment in which this test is likely to be used. So we'll come back to all of this in, in discussion. Uh, we're going to turn now to another presenter from uh, Mother Risk, uh, Mumita Starkar, and uh, uh, Mumita is going to uh, uh, um, talk uh, more further about uh, the uh, screening for problem drinking and early Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. So my presentation today will hopefully provide you with a better understanding of what the Maternal Drinking History Guide is all about and what role it plays as part of the National FASD Screening Toolkit. So it's been four decades since we've been aware of the fact that alcohol use in pregnancy can result in FASD. 
yet there are still a significant proportion of women that do continue to drink because they simply can't stop. So who are these women? Well, we are aware of the fact that many of these women do meet the DSM-4 criteria for alcohol addiction or dependency, yet a large proportion based on research suggests um, engage in what is known as problem drinking. And the NIAAA defines this as engaging in binge drinking or those women who have more than seven drink over the course of the week. Of course, anyone who's planning and having or pregnant is uh, any amount of drinking would be considered risky. So how can we prevent FASD? So the first step would be to routinely ask over and over about women's um, alcohol and drug use. So any women of childbearing age should be asked about uh, if alcohol or drug use is part of their lifestyle. It is also important to inform these women and educate them about the fact that no alcohol is really the only safest option. And finally, to help these women to reduce their alcohol consumption through information and counseling and uh, referring them to available resources. Unfortunately, routine screening does not occur and survey studies have shown that many of the most common reasons are due to time limitations, uh, discomfort about approaching women about test sensitive topics such as alcohol or drug use, and deterring them from actual health care that they came from, uh, not being aware of what the most uh, effective tools would be, and most importantly, the lack of resources. Another important thing to recognize is that many of these women who engage in problem drinking uh, during pregnancy find it difficult to stop, yet they are most often the ones that go unrecognized by their health care providers because they don't present as alcohol um, dependent women would. Sorry. Um, and this, for this reason, it is very, very important to ask each and every woman about their alcohol use in pregnancy. Now, FASD diagnosis is key in the context of this national toolkit that, has been, that is being developed. And there's a, there are a number of requirements that need to be met in order for the diagnosis to take place. And one of the most important ones is this confirmation of prenatal alcohol exposure. And this is really where the maternal drinking guide came in because as the tool was being developed, it became quite obvious that knowledge of mother's drinking history was key in order to take this initiative forward. So the maternal drinking guide has, uh, has twofold purpose. The first is basically to identify at-risk mothers. And secondly, was to obtain accurate maternal use history. This knowledge is obviously not just important for subsequent FASD diagnosis for the children in the future, but also to initiate harm reduction strategies for both mother and child. Okay. So there are several benefits to the maternal drinking guide. The first and most important is to make you understand that most of the components that, are, that comprise of this tool is based on validated methodology. The, the screening levels and the questions that are included have been found to be effective means of eliciting, of getting the accurate amount of maternal alcohol being used. Moreover, practitioners are provided with several different options and the decision of which one they want to choose will be based on the type of population they're screening for. No training or expertise is really required to use this maternal history guide and it's quite easy to integrate most of the screening tool, uh, screening procedures into standardized um, questionnaires to ask women about their alcohol use. So when is it important to use this guide? Well, for non-pregnant women, it would be at least at every annual health checkup. And for pregnant women, um, at very minimal, it should be asked at in initial visits, but also uh, to be continued at every subsequent visit. So the maternal drinking guide is comprised of three different levels of alcohol um, screening. The first and most basic of which is referred to as practice-based screening. And this comprises of 
using one single question about alcohol or drug use and combining it with motivational interviewing techniques and supportive dialogue, dialogue in order to get the most accurate self-reporting. The second level is based on structured questionnaires. Structured questionnaires have been found to be quite effective. And in this case, the provider is given either the option of directly asking about alcohol and substances or indirectly by use of taste or tweak tool. The third level of screening is based on lab-based. I won't go into this because Joey has just given you an example of how effective this is. So how does this, how would one start using the guide? Well, the first step would be to, to begin with an introductory statement such as, I want to ask you a series of questions today about your lifestyle. I ask all my patients these questions because it really helps me to get to know you better and provide better care. From there, one question regarding her alcohol or drug use can be embedded into the standard questionnaire that are usually used in clinical settings, such as, do you ever enjoy a drink or two, or when was the last time you had a drink? Again, as I mentioned, interviewing techniques um, that motivate accurate responses, um, minimizes any underreporting, has been shown through supportive dialogue such as, well, can you tell me a bit more about your drinking pattern before you knew you were pregnant? Now, the next level of screening, which is the structured questionnaire, has been found, as I mentioned, to be quite effective. And they can act providers have the option of actually asking directly about how much or how often, or they can choose to indirectly ask about the alcohol use by using taste or tweak tools. Now, both of these tools have been validated and developed specifically to be used among pregnant women. So they have, um, they're, they're found to be optimal because they overcome issues of underreporting by focusing on tolerance of alcohol use. For those of you that are not familiar with this tool, I've provided here an example of what this test and how it works. So the question, well, how many drinks does it normally take to make you feel the first effect of alcohol? A response of at least three or more drinks would yield her two points. Similarly, a positive response to any of the remaining four questions would yield her either one or two points, totaling a score of seven. So if a woman scores at least two or more out of seven, she would be identified as an at-risk mother. The third level, which is the lab-based tools, are quite accurate and precise in confirming maternal exposure uh, during pregnancy. However, they can be expensive and should be limited to cases where there are child protection agencies' involvement. So once we know that these women are at-risk drinkers, what's the next step? The next step would really be to educate and inform these women about what the potential risks are. And this process can be approached by saying something like, well, here's some information that's been learned through research, and I'd really like to share it with you. Or open it up and ask her what her understanding of the alcohol is uh, during pregnancy. Now, in this slide um, is a flow chart that would help guide how the screening process occurs. It summarizes the three levels of screening so that when a patient is uh, presented in clinic, the provider can start off with an introductory statement and then move on to filling out their standardized questionnaires, among which has to include a question regarding her alcohol drug use. Upon establishing that the patient does include alcohol as part of her lifestyle, it is then important to determine if she's an at-risk mother or if she just drinks socially. And this can be done either by directly asking her questions regarding um, her alcohol use or by applying the tweak test. A positive response to her um, drinking alcohol at least one or more times in the week to either of the two questions or scoring two or more in, on the tweak would identify her as an at-risk drinker. It's very important to keep in mind that these types of screening should be done at every subsequent visit as well, so that if there's any change in her alcohol consumption, that can be identified. The third level of screening, which is the hair test um, and use, use of alcohol markers, would be 
limited to certain cases. So what are some of the take-home messages with this guide? First and foremost, you see that level one screenings, which is one single question about alcohol and drug use, have to be asked at every single um, presentation for all women of childbearing age. Secondly, the level two screening to identify at risk drinkers should also be adopted as standard screening, and especially in the case of planning of pregnant women. And finally, it's very, very important that upon screening, women do need to be linked to services that are available. And with technology being what it is, this is becoming easier day by day. Here are only a few of the various FASD programs and resources out there, um, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, so I won't go over them. I'd like to thank Dr. Porn, my mentor, the alcohol counselors, the task force and tech sorry, task force that are involved in writing the content of this guidebook. Thank you. Great. Thanks, um, Mumita. Um, now, one of the reasons we're here in uh, Prince Edward Island today is, is because uh, as part of the KFC uh, uh, tool, toolkit development that uh, was uh, supported at the outset by the Public Health Agency of Canada, uh, we have initiated a program in Prince Edward Island, and Kathy uh, Bigsby is going to tell us about what's been happening. Thank you. Yeah, I decided my job here was to inject some local flavor since it isn't lobster season exactly. And, uh, here we go. Um, so we're very interested here in uh, in. Uh, Meconium. Uh, we've been scooping poop now for um, uh, since last November. So uh, I think every good research project starts with a question, and the question that uh, I started with was, do we have FASD here in PEI? Um, and there are a lot of us who are interested in this who really felt that fetal alcohol was under-recognized uh, and under-diagnosed in this province. And uh, so we thought that maybe we should try to find a way to understand the magnitude of the problem here in our province. So along came the uh, perinatal research team, and we're under the leadership of Dr. Janet Bryant, and those of you who are here uh, tomorrow will meet Janet. And uh, she pulled together a group of interested uh, researchers from our province, and we were invited to uh, submit projects. And, and my idea was that maybe we should just scoop poop on every PE Islander born uh, for a full year and find out whether or not the meconium was positive for, uh, for alcohol metabolites. Uh, so the research questions that we developed were, what is the prevalence of second and third trimester fetal alcohol exposure obtained through meconium-based analysis in PEI infants? And we picked a 12-month period, which turned out to be November 2010 to November 2011. And then what we thought we would do was we would look at our own perinatal database to look at the self-reported rates of alcohol use in pregnancy. Now, our database is somewhat incomplete, and we, we are not, un unfortunately, going to be able to get concurrent numbers from uh, 2010, 2011. But we were going to look back on the, uh, the uh, data that we have, which was from 1992, 2004, uh, in our database. So we also wanted to know what then what the prevalence of the reported exposure um, was compared with what we got through our meconium testing. We really thought that if we had some accurate information on prenatal alcohol exposure, it would provide a baseline for an approach in our province to prevention, diagnosis, and intervention. Again, we really felt that this was an under-recognized problem. We really thought that if we had some good data, then we could increase awareness in the, in the general community as well as the professional community that this is a public health issue. We thought that there was a, a potential to reach professionals and we also thought that we might be able to contribute something to the Foundation for Ongoing Research and Policy Initiatives. So when we were designing our study, we really I had no idea that this was done before when I started looking at it. I, I was really interested in my own neighborhood. And, and sure enough, it's been done before. Um, uh, Joey and his group did it in Grey Bruce, and a group in the Yukon also did it, uh, uh, screening newborns in, in Whitehorse. But what we thought we would bring to it was a provincial cohort. Uh, so, so we're not looking at just one region. We really um, 
by looking at every newborn in the province, including our high-risk newborns that we send away for delivery, that we would have a different kind of a population sample. And of course, being totally self-serving about it, we were really interested in, in using this data to affect public policy in our own province. So what we decided was that we would do an anonymous uh, provincial prevalence study uh, and Janet is our researcher and she said it was a descriptive prospective design. Our uh, population then was going to be all infants born on PEI during this consecutive 12 month period and we are estimating that we will have about 1500 samples. We also arranged to collect meconium samples on the infants whose mothers were transferred either to the IWK, which is our regional children's hospital in Halifax, or to Moncton where there is a neonatal unit as well. Um, and uh, we, would, we would get samples from those infants as well. We were not going to include meconium samples on mothers who refused to participate, but we did not ask for consent. So uh, the study design was pretty simple and all we could handle was simple. Um, we uh, considered the possibility of, uh, of doing something a little fancier, perhaps comparing uh, the, um, the assays from hair as well as from meconium, but we really felt that this was all we could handle. And we really felt very strongly that we wanted to include all infants. And, and again, once you get into the area of um, asking for consent, we already knew from the work that Joey's group had done was that we would cut down our numbers and we really didn't want to do that. Uh, we do have posters up around our, uh, our department. There's no mystery that we're collecting these samples, but we're not requiring consent. And it is interesting because a lot of parents do ask and they quite, help, they, they quite cheerfully help scoop poop for us. Um, and then the samples are frozen and shipped to the mother risk lab in Toronto. So the other part of the analysis is to extract that 15 years of data from our PEI perinatal database going back to 1990. And we are going to look at maternal self-reports of drinking, including binge drinking and heavy drinking. The challenge here is that the way that question has been asked over the last couple of decades has changed. But that's going to be part of our analysis because really when you think about public policy and trying to, to influence um, how we look at this, um, how we've asked the question and ascertained what alcohol use is in pregnancy uh, has influenced that policy. So, so that's going to be an interesting part of our analysis. And then of course we'll compare that with the results from our meconium testing. Uh, we did obtain ethics approval from the UPEI Research Ethics Board and our own PEI Research Ethics Board. And the IWK in, uh, in Halifax also approved our study. But to our amazement, we were unable to get ethics approval from uh, New Brunswick. And in spite of what we thought was, was a, a very strong case, including Joey's data saying that when you asked for consent, the, there was a significant drop off in, uh, in samples and a disproportionate drop in the number of positives. Uh, the folks in, in New Brunswick felt that this uh, really, we should get consent from others before we collected the samples. So we are missing, we will be missing those. The, the challenges are still to ensure that we get samples on all the babies that are born outside of Prince Edward Island. Our, our colleagues in, in, Halifax, in Halifax have been magnificent because, of course, we, we routinely collect our samples on all our newborns, but um, they have to pick out the ones from PEI uh, that are born at the IWK, and they've done a really fine job of, of collecting for us. Uh, we have occasional babies who go home before meconium is passed, but that's a highly unusual situation. We know that not all of our samples are going to be suitable and we know that we're not going to catch all of them. And of course there will be some families who do not wish to participate. Um, and we, ha we haven't analyzed our data but the, um, the numbers coming through on those are actually very, very low. As I say, um, uh, people have really bought into the study and supported us. The, uh, the funding, as you know, uh, is funded by the Canadian Association for Pediatric Health Centers through the public, uh, from the Public Health Agency of Canada through um, CAPC, and it is part of this large project on screening tools. The, uh, the funding was interestingly announced just in the months before the new SOGC guidelines on screening for alcohol use in pregnancy, which made us sort of <gasps> gasp, don't change things now that we're collecting uh, these samples, because again, our database predates the, uh, the, this announcement, but we'll, uh, we'll factor that into our analysis. 
the uh, participants in this study are before you, as I say, were led by our fearless leader, uh, Janet Bryanton. Uh, Diane Boswell from our PEI Reproductive Care Program has been very involved. Mary Jean McCarthy is a, another professor in the School of Nursing. Um, I'm the uh, pediatrician here in Charlottetown, and we have uh, nurses from our units who are very involved, in, and you know, you really have to maintain motivation for a study like this. Uh, Dr. Bridget Freeman is a pediatrician in Summerside, and she and her team are doing the same work there. And of course, our, our collaborators and uh, poop analyzers, um, Joey in, in Toronto and uh, his fearless leader, Dr. Korn, we thank them very, very much. We're um, very excited about this project. Uh, to say we uh, all since September, we actually delayed it until November, and uh, we're going to be finishing our sample collection in November this year. And uh, as I say, the nursing staff have done a magnificent job. We really think um, being outside a tertiary care center, being able to do a research project like this has really focused attention on, um, on, on uh, you know, high quality work. I think when, when, when a team is involved in doing research, it really highlights that, that um, the, uh, we, we can be just as much on the cutting edge as anybody else, and, and it's, it's really heightened awareness of wanting to do that. And as I said before, we've had wonderful support from our colleagues in Nova Scotia and actually in our, in, from our colleagues, colleagues in New Brunswick as well who were very disappointed that we couldn't get the ethics approval there. Thanks very much. Uh, okay, well, I think that's uh, an excellent uh, uh, update on the situation in PEI, and I hope you're going to set the stage for uh, numerous questions uh, in another half hour when we uh, get to that part of the program. Um, but we're going to move now into the third uh, area of concerns, and you've heard it referred to uh, off and on in the presentations already. Clearly, there are some important ethical uh, issues around the use of a test of this kind, or indeed, just in relationship to exploring ethanol consumption during pregnancy more generally, uh, and, and hand in hand with those uh, ethical issues uh, go, go uh, some legal questions. So we have two uh, uh, legal uh, authorities with us uh, to, to speak to these questions, and I uh, expect they'll be uh, provocative to everybody in the room and uh, uh, online. The first uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Bernard uh, Dickens. Uh, Bernard is a uh, uh, distinguished, what do I say, do we say jurist? You're, are, are you a jurist? <laughs> no, you're not. Uh, okay, uh, an expert on child and family law in Canada, Professor Emeritus at uh, the University of Toronto, So, and, and long associated with the Hospital for Sick Children and and uh, with uh, interest in child health and child welfare. So, Bernard, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm grateful for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, and uh, I'm in uh, Dr. McLeod's hands uh, regarding keeping to time. I was giving a talk earlier this year uh, when the, uh, uh, the chair was a, was a good friend and he discreetly uh, slipped me a note that I thought said, uh, end in five minutes or two minutes. It actually said, shut up and sit down. <laughs> uh, and and I, I, I'm open to uh, respond to that. The uh, law uh, is relevant to this. It sets a general framework, but it also uh, has uh, uh, unresolved questions. And it does set the broader framework for the, uh, the ethics. Uh, the law says what you may do, what you must do, is better known popularly for saying what you must not do. Uh, it doesn't answer the question what you should do. And it's not always ethical to use your legal powers, and sometimes ethically you're entitled to do more than the law permits. Uh, so this does set the, uh, the framework uh, for uh, uh, ethical considerations. Thank you. I, I am uh, technically challenged. I have a lot of trouble with uh, child-proof bottle tops. <laughs> the law used to be uh, that uh, children born alive could sue their parents for prenatal uh, injuries they suffered. And the Supreme Court changed that uh, in a case in 1999. Uh, this was the case 
uh, that involved a woman suspected of negligent driving. She was involved in an accident. Her child was born in an emergency cesarean, uh, suffering uh, severe impairments. And the, uh, the action was brought by the child's maternal grandfather, uh, uh, paternal grandfather, uh, against the woman who was quite uh, happy to be sued because, of course, uh, she had an insurance policy. Uh, the case was defended by the insurance company, uh, saying that uh, and the court, uh, the Supreme Court, unlike the trial court and the Court of Appeal in New Brunswick, where the case originated, uh, uh, the Supreme Court accepted uh, that in modern times, uh, Pregnant women are no different from non-pregnant women and from all men. They have the same rights of autonomy, uh, including regarding their own unborn children. And so we now have uh, a proposition that pregnant women do not owe legally enforceable duties to their own children uh, before birth. In contrast, of course, healthcare providers uh, do owe legal duties of care to pregnant women and their unborn children uh, to give due warning uh, that there may be prejudice to the children's health uh, once that they are born. And so this becomes a professional responsibility uh, that goes beyond the responsibility of the, uh, of the women patients themselves. When meconium becomes available, uh, uh, such as uh, birth in hospitals or clinics or birthing centers, uh, as we've heard, it can legally be tested without the mother's consent, which of course includes informed consent. It's an ethical nicety, even an ethical requirement to ask for informed consent, uh, but the law doesn't require it. The background to this is a case involving a young man accused of a serious uh, uh, sexual assault. Uh, he was uh, questioned, uh, he was asked to give a DNA sample and on his lawyer's advice he refused, uh, but he was very upset, he was, uh, he was uh, 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 tearful and he asked for a tissue to, uh, to blow his nose. Uh, he threw the tissue into a bin and the police picked it up and did a DNA sample on the mucus on the tissue. And uh, his lawyer objected that since he had refused a DNA sample, this was an unlawful uh, search and seizure. Uh, but the court, Supreme Court disagreed, uh, saying that he had abandoned uh, the tissue uh, and the mucus that it contained. He could have flushed it down the toilet. He could have put it in his pocket. He chose to, ab chose to abandon it. And the police used it. And the court said that they were entitled to do that. That was not an unlawful search and seizure. Uh, we could therefore conclude from that uh, that when uh, a mother uh, uh, permits uh, the uh, meconium to be collected by the birthing center, uh, it can lawfully be tested for the child's well-being, but of course with implications for the mother uh, without uh, consent or informed consent. This, of course, does raise questions under uh, privacy laws uh, protected by the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, the right to uh, security of the person includes security uh, against unexpected uh, investigations, uh, and, of course, under uh, federal uh, privacy laws and particularly uh, provincial privacy laws. So this does have wider implications and, and some of the, uh, the testing that may be conducted. Uh, and the uh, consent that may be given by the, the holder uh, of the sample uh, become important areas of, of future legal development and clarification. Where there can, where, where uh, consent isn't required, uh, there will be legal duties, and of course we've heard uh, that uh, the practice is to ask for uh, consent uh, whether adequately informed or not, we don't have to go into now. Uh, and we've also heard the practice of uh, refusing, uh, of, of uh, refusals uh, being respected. And again, this is ethical practice regarding the privacy rights of the mother, uh, whether it is appropriate practice regarding diagnosis and treatment in the future of the child uh, is a further question. 
uh, there can obviously be conflict uh, between the interests of the woman, the interests of the mother, and the interests of the child. And balancing those competing interests is a question of both ethical and uh, legal interest. Where testing uh, requires uh, surrender of uh, soil diapers, uh, then no uh, questions that only lawyers find interesting arise. Uh, uh, questions of ownership and uh, control come up. Uh, we don't have to be too detailed about this. Clearly the person who buys the diaper or the one to whom the purchaser gives it uh, will be the lawful owner. Uh, the question arises about the meconium. An initial question is whether this is legal property. Uh, the law has evolved uh, since uh, the abolition of slavery. We don't regard uh, living bodies as property, uh, and uh, the law has never regarded dead bodies as property, because property law protects value, and value is often involved with utility, and dead bodies had neither. Uh, they were buried under ecclesiastical law in traditional uh, customary law in Anglo-Saxon practice, which of course Canada, outside Quebec, has inherited, uh, was that uh, bodies, whether living or dead, are not property. But of course we know that today uh, tissues uh, from bodies uh, can have a significant value. Uh, we trade in, in blood, uh, we have uh, prohibitions uh, against uh, sperm and ova being sold, uh, but the legal prohibitions in the Assisted Human Reproduction Act are necessary because in the absence of those prohibitions, uh, these tissues could indeed be sold as property. And in the United States, where those prohibitions don't apply, uh, there is a tariff of how much uh, a healthy graduate student uh, 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 who supplies over is entitled to receive, and the sums uh, run into at least five figures. So we know that uh, tissues can be property, and of course this triggers uh, uh, controversies we don't have to go into now about whether regarding human embryos uh, are to be treated as property, whether they can be marketed or not. The Meconium then uh, is of diagnostic value for the child uh, and that could constitute its property. And of course it's in the possession of the mother. That is, it's outside a hospital to which it's been abandoned uh, while it's still under the mother's control. Uh, she possesses it but she doesn't own it. That is, she can't use it uh, to protect or advance her interests. Uh, she is a trustee for the benefit of the child. And this raises the question of what duties uh, uh, trustees owe. And this is summarized uh, by the duty of trustees of property they possess but don't own to use that property in the best interest of the child. And of course that triggers the question, uh, what are the best interests of the child? The legal uh, implications are of course that the uh, if not the meconium itself, then its diagnosis identified in the uh, records, the health records of the child, uh, are open to subpoena. Uh, a court can demand their presentation and their explanations, uh, and it can come up in child protection proceedings. That is, if the woman is a chronic uh, abuse drinker, uh, this could affect the well-being of the born child and whether the child is in need of protection, if not actually physically abused, uh, is a question that uh, child welfare courts can be concerned with. In the event of a matrimonial dispute, a contest over the custody of the child, uh, the mother's adverse behavior uh, would uh, count against her in a custody dispute. And once the child is born, there could be legal proceedings uh, prosecution or on conviction of questions of sentencing as a mother, uh, perhaps are convicted of criminal negligence causing bodily harm. Uh, also, of course, there are duties that parents that are under the criminal code to provide their children with what are described as necessaries of life, and that would include indicated medical care. Uh, so there, uh, there could be implications 
for the mother uh, from disclosure of the child's medical record indicating uh, it's a, a, a subjection to uh, fecal alcohol uh, before birth with implications of following birth. The testing of anonymous samples uh, to determine their prevalence uh, does raise uh, the same implications for the individual woman, uh, but this does have implications both legal and ethical for population groups. Uh, we've heard of uh, testing defined populations. Uh, how are those populations defined? Is it subject to uh, racial profiling? Uh, does this target uh, uh, disadvantaged populations? And of course, one one thing particularly of uh, Aboriginal populations, whether they've been on reserve or uh, off reserve. Uh, so a number of legal questions uh, about the uh, stigmatization, the stereotyping, the negative stereotyping of particular population groups uh, would come into the, uh, into the issue here. Obtaining information on a, an identifiable individual, an identifiable individual mother, uh, again uh, raises questions even if the testing is not dependent on consent uh, of whether uh, one gives information uh, that is between testing with consent or without consent. There is the middle ground of testing with information. Uh, and if the mother, if either parent, is given information of the routine neonatal testing of the child, uh, then there may be objection. Uh, we've heard that the practice is to respect those objections. We can see that as consistent with good uh, a doctor-patient, healthcare provider-patient relations, uh, but uh, this begs the question of whose interests are served, that is, would protecting the mother uh, uh, deny the child uh, benefits uh, to overcome the child's disadvantages at birth? The, the final question uh, is one that's uh, been uh, addressed in the proposition uh, that uh, harm reduction strategies can be implemented uh, if women at risk can be identified before pregnancy uh, or before birth. Uh, uh, that is, if in the second or the third trimester one can identify a problem drinking, uh, then uh, the question is whether uh, that is or ought to be a part of the routine standard of care. Uh, Dr. Sarkar has identified uh, the strategies uh, that uh, can be implemented, whether there is a legal duty to provide those strategies uh, in the child's best interests uh, is something that will uh, perhaps uh, before long uh, come before the court. Uh, that is, the standard of care uh, is not simply a question of medical practice. Uh, there are legal requirements that set minimum standards of practice uh, that the courts will require. And if those practices are not implemented when they could and should be, uh, then uh, there could be uh, legal liabilities uh, to the children whose uh, future uh, well-being, whose future education uh, could be improved with appropriate uh, treatment. And there can also be uh, legal duties, as I indicated earlier, uh, to the mothers who would deny the opportunity uh, to change their behavior uh, and uh, save the well-being of their children. This then is, is uh, the, uh, the legal framework of uh, the uh, questions of what may be done, what must be done, what must not be done, uh, but now the key questions of what should be done, the ethical questions, and those are going to be addressed and hopefully answered in the next presentation. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Bernard, for a um, very lucid and uh, logical uh, exposition on a on a complicated uh, subject. And I'm sure there are going to be many questions that we'll want to come back to in the in the discussion on, on the points that you've uh, you've raised. But you certainly are were extraordinarily clear. Uh, now, our uh, final speaker before we get into the discussion is uh, Anna Zabnanski. Uh, from uh, Calgary and Alberta Children's Hospital, and uh, she's going to continue on the ethical legal exposition.
Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, everyone, for having me here in um, PEI. I'm afraid that Dr. Dickens has set me up for failure because I have more questions than I do <laughs> answers. Um, hopefully, I'll be able to um, make some comments that get you all thinking that will lead to some constructive conversation around the issue of what should be done with the climate uh, screening or in utero exposure to alcohol. Um, I am a lawyer and I'm also a clinical ethicist and I work as a clinician at Albert Children's Hospital which is a really privileged um, position. There are only a handful of other ethicists in the country um, who get to work with patients and families at the bedside and support teams that are making challenging decisions such as the decision of whether to accede to uh, a request for medical screening and whether um, the screen is going to give us information that is going to help the child and, and uh, potentially the child's family. Those are the kind of questions that come my way when clinicians have misgivings or questions around um, practice issues. So I'm going to talk about some uh, principles of clinical ethics that I think are useful to help structure our thinking around meconium screening. And I'm going to share with you um, two cases. Um, they're both publicly available on um, the Canadian Legal Information Institute database if you want to read about them further. Um, but I think that they raise some important questions that are worthy of discussion in this forum. So there are numerous clinical ethics frameworks that I teach uh, the students in medical school at the University of Calgary and that we can use to dissect um, uh, tough ethics questions. These are the Belmont principles that came out of the United States in the 1970s and this is the easiest work by far to teach. There are the principles of autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. The definition of an ethical dilemma is when you have a conflict between two or more of these principles, when you know what the right thing to do is but you don't have the resources to do it, or when you know what the right thing to do for a child is but you don't know what the consequences are going to be uh, potentially for a mother. I think that some of these principles of ethics will help us uh, to think about the challenges from a legal and ethical perspective that meconium screening uh, raises. The principle of autonomy generally refers to respect for patient autonomy, but we know that in the pediatric context, context we use um, a best interest standard. Informed consent is often a common thread um, of respecting patient autonomy, um, but I'm not sure where that gets us in the context of neonates. Beneficence is a clinical obligation to do good. It's to have a care plan that is going to be able to benefit our patients, and um, questions about what is the right thing to do come under the heading of beneficence. The corollary of that is the principle of non-maleficence, and that's an obligation not to create harm. And I think we actually have an obligation to um, prevent foreseeable harm. Um, sometimes there's a conflict between beneficence and non-maleficence, non particularly when there's two patients in the equation, one being a mother and the second being a neonate. And then the principle of justice, I think, weighs heavily um, in a conversation around meconium screening, at least um, in Canada at present. Justice uh, means a couple of things, depending on which type of justice you're talking about. Issues involving fundamental justice were uh, raised by Dr. Dickens. Those are uh, um, the rights that are enshrouded by our Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Typically in a clinical ethics setting when we're talking about justice, we're talking about distributive justice and the equitable allocation of resources and offering services um, uh, to our patients that are uh, available um, to all patients and families. And justice also touches on principles of organizational ethics, including um, policies and clinical practice guidelines. So there are two legal cases that I'd like to share with you today. Both of them um, uh, come from the province of Ontario and both have been decided recently, um, as recently as uh, 2007 and 2010. I have a study that's been going on in Calgary and the Alberta Law Foundation uh, has graciously funded um, some graduate work. I've looked at all of the legal cases um, in Canada that have um, referred to meconium. And there uh, are many. Um, most of them are trauma cases where there's been a meconium aspiration and those aren't necessarily the cases that I'm interested in. Some are interested in what the courts 
have done with meconium screening in Canada and questions the courts have been asking um, since the mid 2000s. Um, only recently have we seen a lot more meconium scre screening cases come to court in a variety of Canadian provinces. The overwhelming majority of them um, have been in um, child apprehension proceedings where meconium screening results have been mentioned um, only in passing and the judgments haven't focused on whether a screen um, should be admitted or not. But I think that the cases reveal a lot. The first case, some of you might be aware of it, um, it's a case that I call KM, where meconium screening evidence was admitted uh, in uh, the Ontario Superior Court of Justice. So Kay was a young woman who had had several pregnancies. Um, her first uh, baby that was born alive was born premature, um, I think around 33 or 34 weeks. He weighed 4.4 pounds and he was born in Brampton in 2003. He um, was in an NICU for many weeks until he was discharged home. Within the first few days of being sent home, um, Kay was with her son alone for the first time. Uh, the case reveals that she had rather a lot of support in the hospital setting um, and the support of her partner, but once she was at home alone with her um, um, and her partner had gone to work, um, she became frustrated. And I don't say that to defend her, but the consequence is that her baby was um, vigorously shaken and he had uh, to be airlifted to the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. Um, Kay was charged with aggravated assault under Section 725 of the Canadian Criminal Code. She entered um, a guilty plea, which means that there was um, no trial of guilt or innocence. She was admitting to the crime, and so the issue that came before the court was a sentencing issue. And this is where the meconium screening evidence um, comes into play. So Kay was um, out on judicial interim release between the entering of her plea and attending before the court for her sentencing hearing. And while um, on judicial interim release, she became pregnant with a second child, this time a baby girl, who uh, was born at term, um, but was immediately apprehended by the Children's Aid Society based on the crime that had been committed against the previous um, little boy. Um, notwithstanding that the baby was apprehended, um, her meconium was screened and became part of her health record. And it was the meconium screening evidence from baby B that was admitted um, before the court in the sentencing hearing pertaining to uh, baby A. And in um, a sentencing decision that exceeds 30 pages, which is uncommon in a case like this, the judge um, discussed um, admission of the meconium screening evidence in great detail and um, <clears throat> experts were called to testify as to uh, what the screen meant. But the judge was able to use um, the screening evidence in a way um, <clears throat> that had implications for the depiction of Kay's character even though the sentence that the judge had discretion to um, hand down was limited under the criminal code, he didn't have um, discretion to exceed um, the sentencing provision pertinent to that crime. Um, but, he, um, but he had a lot to say about um, whether or not to admit meconium screening evidence and what it meant um, about Kay and what that evidence meant um, for future children if Kay should have future children. Um, the admission of that evidence also informed a lot about what the justice had to say um, about Kay's sentencing conditions, um, who she was allowed to see once she was incarcerated, where she would live, and who she could have contact with. And I think that case raises a number of interesting questions. Given that, to my knowledge, we don't have any clinical guidelines around meconium screening in Canada yet, and um, I think that that's what we're here to discuss today, is the appropriate place for meconium screening. When you think about the clinical ethics principles that I introduced in the previous slide, autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice, there are a lot of tensions at play in a decision like this. 
And that's not a comment on um, the sentence that was handed down. That's not a comment on um, the aggravated assault that took place. But I think that there uh, are questions that the judiciary should know about in the context of meconium screening um, that have yet to be asked. This case has gone on to serve as persuasive authority in other cases under meconium screening and has been used as uh, somewhat of a precedent in Manitoba. Um, and so it's an interesting observation for me to see how um, an Ontario justice's comments regarding the addition of meconium screening um, can go on to impact other cases in other jurisdictions in a way that we couldn't have anticipated when we were um, developing the screen and talking about um, the information that the screen would give us and potential benefits that it could offer to um, children who were exposed. And I'm going to ask you, you've got up there positive drug metabolites screen and, and drug screen results. Are you talking only meconium or were there other uh, drug screens involved? So no, this is only meconium, um, and um, I'm not talking about um, fatty acid ethyl esters. In this case, the, the metabolites that were identified, I believe, were um, cannabis and uh, and cocaine. Joe, uh, correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. Um, but no, there, there was no blood or urinalysis done on ABB. Um, it was just a meconium screen. Um, for informational purposes, I assume. Okay. So the second um, case that I think is interesting um, raises questions of distributive justice as opposed to the fundamental justice questions that case case raised. And I could have picked any case. There is really no rhyme or reason to why I picked this case. When you look through um, legal databases that exist, you see this story and this pattern uh, time and time again. And this is how screening evidence makes its way into legal decisions about child apprehension. Um, and in this case, the, the issue that was to be decided at the court was who was the best person to take care of the, of the young baby. It was a decision around interim care and custody of um, a baby boy in Ontario. So this is a young, high-risk family. And when I say young, high-risk family, I mean that they had had their first baby together at the age of 19, but both of them had grown up as children in um, very difficult home environments, broken homes. Both of them had had Children's Aid Society involvement as kids coming up before they got together and started a family. Um, so the Children's Aid Society is known to both mom and dad in this case. They had had a daughter one year earlier who was born at 34 weeks. And unfortunately, um, she died of what was characterized as a SIDS death in the case. When she wasn't um, in their care, um, she was being babysat by maternal grandma when she passed away. A year later, um, they were pregnant with their second um, child. And they had no uh, direct involvement with the Children's Aid Society in Ontario at this time. However, um, they were a low-income family, and they were involved with Ontario Works. Ontario Works notified the Children's Aid Society um, when um, mom was obviously pregnant and approximately six weeks prior to delivery, the Children Aid, Children's Aid Society opened a file based on many flags, not limited to but including their previous involvement as children with the Children's Aid Society and the fact that they had had previous infant death. Um, alerts were sent out to a variety of hospitals in and around the area saying that the hospital was to notify the Children's Aid Society when this mother was to have her baby. She had had relatively good prenatal care. She did have an obstetrician, and she had attended her prenatal appointments regularly. Um, the Children's Aid Society was notified by a hospital in Oakville uh, when mom came in. She presented in labor. Um, she had a term baby boy. He weighed six, uh, just over six and a half pounds with grade after nine and nine. Uh, the same day, shortly after she delivered him, the Children's Aid Society um, showed up at the hospital with three um, police officers from the Halton Regional Police to have a conversation about uh, the parenting plan um, for their little boy. And um, previous to his delivery, the Children's Aid Society had suggested to the hospital that they um, get consent for screening for um, both mom and uh, the baby. 
which the parents had declined um, because they didn't want to have any involvement um, with the law or with the Children's Aid Society. Um, the boy was apprehended and it took these parents um, nearly three months um, and court made a decision um, that they were the best people to be caring for him, so he was returned to their care under the supervision of the Children's Aid Society. I'm presenting this case to you because there are probably 10 or 12 cases just like it from Ontario and BC that I can find uh, in the case law databases that suggest to me that we really need to have some clinical practice guidelines in place. If we're putting hospitals and hospital staff in a position of um, asking families uh, to consent to screening, particularly uh, absent a clinical indication, then I think that they would benefit from, from uh, some guidance. Also, cases like this raise real distributive justice questions around the allocation of resources. The hospitals that I work in um, are very um, leery about getting into a situation like this where a social worker from the province is requesting a screen and the hospital isn't certain about the propriety of that screen, how it's going to help a child, whether or not it will change man management for a child. Um, and clinicians, but physicians in particular, are very nervous about putting, being put in a position of wearing two hats. Physicians have a fiduciary obligation to the patients that they serve. And that obligation encompasses the duty of loyalty and trust. And they don't want to be seen as contributing to a legal case or endangering the therapeutic relationship that they need to have with women. Um, and uh, the same thing for pediatricians who are supporting children. Part of supporting children, at least in 99% of the cases, means supporting their families. And it's very difficult to have a good and open dialogue with families when they're worried about where screening um, results might end up and, and where that will take us in some cases. So I'm going to wrap it up. Um, there have been ethics policy consultations at a number of hospitals, particularly in Western Canada, around um, what to do uh, when the question of meconium screening comes up, uh, given that there aren't any practice guidelines currently. Um, and so my bottom line is that until we have something in place that's going to support physicians and hospitals and is going to clarify the rights, responsibilities, and duties of people who work in the various professions involved, um, I think we need to be very careful, um, and I think that the Canadian courts need to be careful about using meconium screening uh, evidence, in, particularly in criminal justice proceedings. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I want to thank uh, all the members of the panel for uh, being, first of all, on time, but uh, secondly, very uh, clear about what the issues are. And, I think they've uh, set the table for uh, an interesting discussion. So we have a roving microphone in the room, which will be borne to you at the first indication of your interest by Elaine uh, Orbein. Uh, and for those of you uh, online, uh, this is your chance as well to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, offer us some questions. Uh, and we'll keep an eye on those and try to group them uh, so they make some, some sense. Uh, so, are there questions in the room? So, please introduce yourselves uh, for the people online. Uh, okay. when you... I'm Jo Nansen from Saskatoon, and I have a question about the uh, first case example we saw in uh, uh, Anne's presentation, and that was whether the the parent whose meconium was subsequently used in the um, various proceedings had given informed consent for that meconium to be collected in the first place. Yes. Okay, so that was the KM case that dealt with aggravated assault. Yes. And no, the child was absent immediately at birth, and so Kay wouldn't have been in a position to be giving consent because the child was a ward of the province of Ontario at that time. Okay. Thank you. Where children are apprehended at birth, there's already set up for quarter. Oh, sure. Okay, great. Um, 
In cases where children are apprehended at birth, it's important to keep in mind that meconium results take about three weeks to get back. So the reason for the child being apprehended at birth is argued before a judge prior to having evidence of prenatal exposure to drugs or alcohol. So that's uh, so. And once the child's in the care of the Children's Aid Society, they can request tests. Uh, via a physician, and it's the physician's role to determine is this test uh, applicable to the health and well-being of the child in terms of moving forward for assessment. So if I can just follow up on, on what Joey has said, um, which I absolutely agree with, there's usually a long set of indicia to apprehend a child, and it's not just based on the suspicion of um, substance abuse in pregnancy. Um, from a, from a legal perspective, the problem that I am running into now that I'm reading all of these cases, and some of them have had time to get to the appellate level, um, is that um, the fact that all of those indicia existed for the apprehension in the first place seems to be lost on the judiciary when we get to the appellate level. We recently had a Court of Appeal decision in British Columbia which stated that based on meconium screening results, the child was apprehended. Um, which is something that I call legal fiction. We know that in reality there's really a lot going on for these women and their families. And I know that in my clinical practice um, a set of eight or twelve indicia need to be present. But somebody reading a case where a judge has said based on the McCombie screening evidence child B was apprehended um, isn't necessarily going to know that. And I think that as far as the development of our jurisprudence goes, that puts us on a potentially slippery slope, and I actually don't know that the Canadian judiciary is aware of um, some of the harms that can come from making a statement like that um, written into a case. Bernard, did you have a comment? On Just a, a, a side comment on the way the question was put. Uh, is the fact about the mother's meconium and the child? I think we have a question. Yeah. Uh, here and the, there's one online that I'll go to. Yeah. Okay, my name is Debbie Reamer. I'm from Nova Scotia and a social worker. Don't hold that against me. Um, in the second case, I just it wasn't clear to me why the child was removed at birth. It, was it because the parents had been involved with child welfare as children? Was it because they refused to have the test for the screening done? I don't know why the child was removed, and I'm yeah. So it's all of it. It's the, all of the red flags that that existed from their previous involvement as children with the Children's Aid Society. Um, mom's mental health issues played a role. Dad's mental health issues played a role. Previous histories of substance use as teenagers before they. Um, started a family played a role, their low income housing um, played a role, the fact that they wouldn't agree to a home assessment played a role. There's a number of things that the mm -hmm. judge talks about in that case, and it's really a fulsome picture that's pre presented in the case. Mm -hmm. um, but it was really the position that, that the nursing staff and the hospital staff in that I, that I wanted to, to bring up by highlighting mm -hmm. uh, the case. I think, though, that it needs to be recognized that it also puts families in a really bad position if they say no. Oh, well, yes. Right? So that was, yeah. I have other questions, but I can wait. Well, and it's, it's an interesting comment. What's really compelling for me about the second case is how coming off of a previous loss a year earlier with the Sid's death of their mm -hmm. daughter, um, the end of her pregnancy and her birth experience was arguably ruined by the events that ensued and resulted in the apprehension of their child. Um, I can't even begin to put myself in the shoes of that mother, but it's also very diff difficult for a clinical care team who has an obligation to be family-centered in the care that they provide to provide family-centered care in that um, adversarial context. Mm -hmm. Jordan, I think we have one online and then we'll We'll yeah, we have one online. I mean, certainly as you present that, that case, though, it does uh, sound like, the, to, to my ears at least, like the Children's Age Society was being uh, 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 somewhat uh, heavy-handed. Is, is that a fair judgment? Well, yes. In the end, the judge decided that the parents were the best people to 
be raising yeah. that child with the supervision of the Children's Aid Society. Um, but, but, just, uh, but the damage that may have resulted from the actions of the Children's Aid Society can't be reversed by a legal judgment. Well, that's correct. Yeah. Okay, uh, we do have a question uh, on online, and I think uh, uh, probably, uh, well, the, the, the question is, what about the mother in an affluent family who hides behind uh, socioeconomics? Uh, um, the, the socioeconomic situation she's currently living in, but she's uh, been drinking uh, even small amounts, uh, uh, and then has a child with FAS or FASD. Uh, uh, the Mary analogy is the more, uh, uh, I'm not sure I understand, the, the Mary analogy is the more clear-cut forerunner for FAS, uh, FASD. Um, sorry, so who, who so had, Mary. you had the Mary analogy. Thanks. I would just comment that that's right. The Mary analogy reflects the smaller proportion of the population that we can easily identify as being at risk with some of the information we've just heard around case reports, past involvement in systems of care, past challenges in their um, early life, midlife, and late life environment. The woman that is at risk of having an alcohol exposed pregnancy that's protected by good nutrition, high socioeconomic status, high education, and often what we see is low dose, continuous, we call low dose, routine drinking, is a different Client. And I think that in an area like this, we're going to have to have different strategies for different clients. The challenge with that woman, and she's often a delayed childbearer as well, is having the information communicated to her in a way that makes meaning and a way that allows her to address these behaviors. Uh, I think it's both and. And I think we also have to understand if some of the stresses that are on the Mary story that impact fetal development actually are the same ones that impact fetal development in the other woman. And that's the argument that we get in the clinic all the time, that she's got all these other protective factors, but does she really? So it's, um, it's really important that our strategies encompass all of these women if we're looking at a population health approach. If I could add to that, um, currently what's in practice right now is, is in effect, targeted screening, meaning there's a clinical indicator for why you want to follow up uh, there being prenatal alcohol exposure. So these, this subset of women we're talking about won't have those clear clinical indicators, and that raises the argument for universal as opposed to targeted screening, which levels uh, the playing field and also will increase the number of children that are neurodevelopmentally affected that we'll be able to, to detect. So that's one of the... Um, we, in fact, do targeted screening now, uh, just as clinical practice, when a physician finds out about something that, that they know about, that there is a follow-up to be done, and they will act on it, hopefully. Uh, but with such high rates as uh, Dr. Tuff showed in her presentation, uh, there is a discussion to be had about the merits of universal screening, which will uh, include women uh, with an objective measure like uh, meconium testing, the only difference is dose, so the, the SES has become as much so as both of you Both of you are speaking in a way to the point that Anna made that it's high time that we had clearer practice guidelines on when, when and how screening should be used. Uh -huh. Well, there's, sorry. Um, there, there are a couple of, of significant issues that Anna raised. Uh, I think there's the medical side, and where uh, the medical side, I think there's a pretty good consensus that we want to use whatever tools are available at our disposal to identify a child as alcohol exposed so we can mobilize health and uh, health care to the child and to the mother. Where it goes into the legal realm, I think we still are dealing with a lot of laws that aren't based on evidence-based criteria pertaining to what the substance use in the mother actually mean in terms of risk to the child. And uh, so I think in the legal realm, there's, there's a much larger host of interpretive issues. Um, yeah. And just one follow-up thing, and the other is the follow-up developmental issues. So there's social advantage protect against some of the biologic disadvantage, and we need to understand more about that through follow-up work. Uh, one of the projects we've been looking at is do these children show up in the ADHD clinic instead of in an FASD clinic, and are there ways that we can distinguish through testing whether or not it was actually prenatal alcohol exposure or whether or not it's actually ADHD. So 
I think it's a gray box, you know, biologic advantage, social advantage. The Mary story has a lot of lifestyle and social disadvantage that's going to also limit optimal development. Uh, Absolutely, we'll pick. Uh, just a few uh, comments about, you know, leveling the playing field and doing prevalence estimates through the general population. I think this is eventually where we need to go, however, we know the minimum, minimum prevalence of high risk groups. They all average out around 10%. That's whether you're in a youth justice or a federal prison or in an NICU or children in care. It's around 10%. We better build capacity. And those are the kids that are already readily identified because they're in a high risk group. I think there's going to be a process and eventually population screening. But we have to take into account the resources and the capacity. So I wanted to make that as a, a comment, but I did appreciate all the, uh, the wisdom that I heard this afternoon. One other point, um, maybe not entirely related, but related to where you have more than one center involved in a research study, and to have one of the potentially participating groups say this is unethical, there's the appeal. Do you want to just expand on that, your, on your question, the rhetorical question? Uh, well, I think it, it, it begs to um, have the, group, the different centers involved agreeing on the process. And I think the group in New Brunswick probably are not as involved in medical research as the as Dalhousie, for example, which approved it. And, um, and I think that uh, they got, uh, I think, cold feet. So I think there needs to be some sort of appeal when you're dealing with more than one center. Well, so, uh, Kathy, can you answer that? Yeah, that, that was our feeling as well. I, you know, just flipping on my other hat, I, and I did not approve our study here, but I have been chair of our research ethics committee here, and I know that when you get mired in looking at pharma-driven studies, you know, you talk about the principles of ethical decision-making, it's all about autonomy and, and consent, and, and the uh, ethics committees can forget that there are competing ethical principles when you're dealing with vulnerable populations, like infants who might be alcohol exposed, there are other considerations besides consent. Well, it's interesting that your study took place during a time when we were getting a new tri-council policy statement on, um, on ethics. Your study was contemporaneously with religions that were going. The new policy statement, at least on my read, focuses even more on autonomy and consent, consent than ever before. Certainly, I've talked to Rosales and then Dr. Korn. Oh, we, and we had uh, Dr. Matsui as well. I think, actually, I think Murray was we have had a request online that you do introduce yourselves, and I guess that probably applies to the panel too, since they don't know exactly who's talking. I guess actually mine is, oh sorry, uh, Dre <laughs> Matsui, um, I'm actually a pediatrician in London. Um, I had a question actually, maybe it's more for a clarification, because it sort of opened up more cans of worms for me, but you were kept talking about in your recommendations, absent of a clinical indication which I guess in itself could open up a whole other can of worms asking well, what exactly do you mean by that, and often it's delayed. But I guess my question is, um, with a clinical indication then, am I correct to uh, interpret it to say that in reality we don't ask for consent in most situations? I guess our natural tendency as physicians is to ask for that consent. The difficulty being, obviously, in those situations, if you ask for it, I think actually asking for it, having them denied it and going on and doing it, is probably worse than ever having asked for the consent in the first place. Um, and, I mean, it would be nice if that clinical indication was always black and white, but most of the time it isn't, particularly when the decision has to be made relatively quickly, as opposed to, you know, seeing how things clinically work out. So, but. Am I correct to say in that case that it might actually be better not to ask for the consent? Because I could see myself being in more of a dilemma if I actually asked for it, was refused it, and then later on it became even more clinically indicated and, and it was done. Your question is to Anna? Yeah, I think <laughs> No, to a certain extent, I guess Bernard, I guess when I heard the first Bernard talking, I 
and I guess from what Joey said, I, I got the impression um, that, you know, most people would just go ahead and do it without consent, although that wouldn't be my natural tendency. And then I guess I actually haven't heard your talk, which was a little bit more over to the ethical side as opposed to the legal side, I'm even more confused. So I think that your question um, is probably unclear in itself. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that your question sort of hits the nail on the head, actually, in that um, the consent piece, I think, is an open question. And we have some legal answers to that, and we have um, studies and protocols that are in place in certain parts of the country, but clinicians who come to me to ask questions are very unclear about whether or not consent is required, and they're not unclear on the rules. They're unclear because it gives them misgivings. It's that feeling that you get as a clinician in the pit of your stomach when you um, know that there's potentially information that can help a child, but you're uncertain about the uses that it could be put to. Yeah, and I, I guess what I'm saying is the I, I'm actually much more comfortable about the asking for consent absent of a clinical indication because that that I'm more comfortable with. I'm more uncomfortable in the situation when there is a clinical indication, particularly if that clinical indication is a bit fuzzy um, in terms of in that situation of you know deciding whether to ask for consent or not. And like you said, our natural tendency is, you know, in this day of uh, patient-centered care is to involve the parents in that discussion. I would be much more uncomfortable, though, if I asked for it, didn't get it, and then was kicking myself later on saying, well, you know, it really is very much clinically indicated. Uh, so, so, Doreen, I, I think you've raised an interesting question. I, just to remind you, we, we have uh, an hour at the end of the afternoon to formulate some uh, recommendations, some discussion points for tomorrow. And this one is really complex. So in, in deference to the people who are online, I think we'll just, and there are two or three more questions online as well. Uh, so let's hear from Giddy, Corin, Ted, and then, uh, we'll the I probably will say more during the open discussion, but uh, to answer the clinical part of it, I just want us to focus again, uh, both uh, several, uh, Suzanne and Anna talked about the risks of abusing test results. I put it in a wide context. But that's true for people who drive cars or do many other powerful activities which are legal that can go wrong. Do remember these tests are important clinically and the reason to do it is really to help a child and I don't think we should lose focus on this. None of us asked Doreen permission to do VDRL to find baby has syphilis, although the indication for mom are relatively similar. We do it because we want to start penicillin and so on and so forth. So we are not congruent within ourselves. Even. We are not. We do a lot of tests and we are not abusing them necessarily. So I think we have to separate two things here, the validity of the tests and why it will help a child, and then how to make rules and regulations that will not lead to abusing the test. Okay, let's, let's part in this issue for further discussion uh, after, uh, after 3.30. So uh, let's go to, we'll go to Ted, We have a John Wayne who can more or less, uh, you know, do all the dirty things that need to be done. Because uh, to me, I'm more confused listening to everybody, uh, as the general question of who is the professional best suited to really talk to the mom, to the family, about us doing certain procedures as on the child. And I can tell you, having been the last one in about 400 uh, 500, 450 cases, you know, I can see where there's a lot of problems with the initial uh, sort of approach. And most of the time in Newfoundland, it's the poor social worker who have lack experience, have six months of uh, uh, really working, that is given this task. So more with the doctors who uh, I'm not involved with that. So to, to me, this is what I got from listening. And anybody, I'm asking people who 
is one way we're going to help. Actually, did we ask that question of the same woman that talked about universal screening, and they want to hear it from their health care provider. That's where they want the information in general to come from. Are you talking about the general practitioner? I am. I'm talking about the person with whom the woman is most knowledgeable, most familiar, often seen before. Uh, or I think that I could go back and look at it, or a nurse practitioner, or but, but it's a healthcare provider that they would like to champion the information distribution. Well, just from experience, I can tell you most of these women, family that are involved, they see two, three, four, you know, practitioner, <laughs> two, three, four, uh, and perhaps none of them ever saw anybody. Yeah. So really, in terms of having trust, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, again, it's so very. I think uh, that's a, a really important to bring up. It points to where our system as it is um, is a little bit deficient in, in mental health issues. I think the model that, uh, that um, we're, we're going to be publishing shortly by Irene Zellner, using a public health nurse as a go-between, is actually quite good in that uh, we have uh, one individual or a couple of individuals that are specifically trained for this. They are a frontline healthcare provider and they can facilitate the interaction between all the different healthcare services. Now she's not actually ordering the test, but in this case where there was a universal screening program offered in this small population, that public health nurse was an invaluable resource to be able to uh, engage, engage the woman who were physicians or the three or four physicians she previously saw didn't. Okay, we have a couple more uh, questions online, and I just uh, would warn anybody else online, we're going to conclude in about 10 minutes, so if you have the remaining questions, uh, send them to us now. <clears throat> we have a question here um, that uh, says, is there any study that looks at the frequency of meconium screening and income in relationship with income? Are, are we only doing this uh, test on poor women or social, socially marginalized women? So I guess uh, we, uh, that's perhaps for you. We don't have any studies specifically looking at that. I'm not aware of it. It's primarily coming at social services. It's a big driver for the referral. So the demographics would reflect who is involved with social services. Um, I can tell you from my experience that depending on what region and the you know, average income of that region, you, we do get a wide range of, uh, of backgrounds on the parents of children to screen. Um, but the demographics would reflect your typical social service situation. And, and of course, this is not an issue if you're doing a population screen like the one in uh, Prince of Rhode Island or the one you did in Great right. Bruce where, uh, uh, where you took uh, all comers regardless of socioeconomic uh, status. Sure, we actually did a study where we used mostly high income women and scooped the proof into the meconium, mm -hmm. but the results aren't published yet. So we do have a High income population. Uh, uh, hang on, Judy. Just the, 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 the doctor, study, this is Dr. Corin These studies in the States published from Florida uh, on cocaine, not on alcohol, but do show a clear um, uh, discrimination against the poor and the underprivileged. We should not ignore that fact. This is not only with these tests, it's in general. And we should do everything we can as a society, as a practitioners, to avoid it, to fight against it. It doesn't decrease the merit of test. It just increases the chance of abuse. And we should not accept it. But clearly, there was a study in the States published in one of the key pediatric journals showing that. I have another uh, online question here, and I think this is for you, Anna. Uh, uh, your second case. Was there an assumption that the CIS, the previous uh, CIS case, uh, was uh, sus suspicious in some way uh, in, that, uh, in that case? Is that what justified the, inter in the uh, intervention uh, in the second pregnancy? So um, in his reasons for judgment, the judge in the case um, referred to uh, a possibility that the baby who had passed away from SIDS may have um, been exposed to tobacco and or marijuana smoke in the days 
leading up to her death, either in the parents' home or in the grandparents' home where she was when she passed away. However, given that they had no positive information in front of the court, um, he, he couldn't give any weight to the speculations that there may have been a causative reason for the Sid's death. Um, and so, um, on a black letter reading of the law, no, it, it didn't have an impact, but I can tell you that um, on a, a practical level and from a social work perspective, it probably did raise suspicions. And um, his infant death, coupled with a previous relationship with child welfare, is going to raise flags for some family. All right. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, we have time, I think, for maybe one more question. Dr. Bryan, I thought you were going to ask about drinking in Prince Edward Island, but no, that's just a forewarning. Uh, yes, we have a question right over here. Uh, my name is Kennedy Dennis from the University of Alberta. Just a couple of really quick questions. Um, can meconium that is collected for research be used in court? And are the couple of studies that were discussed um, anonymizing data? Uh, so the uh, on two of the three studies that were conducted that I, that I presented and the study that's currently being done in PDI are all anonymized. So there's no uh, there's no ability to trace the sample. The one with informed consent, that result is part of the child's health record. So as with any aspect of the child's health record, if, the, if, a, if a party presents a legal argument as to why uh, privacy law should be uh, you know, overturned and those results should be admitted in court, they, they would be eligible. But it's important to keep in mind that that's the same for any uh, medical record, you know, mental health assessment, given toxicology, there has, there is, it's all protected by privacy law, and an argument has to be made to as to why that evidence would be subpoenaed. Thank you. And just a quick question for Dr. Bixby: um, Have you factored in home births that are happening on the island? Home births on yeah. the island? Yeah. <laughs> they're they're just accidental. Oh really? Okay. <laughs> They're on the island. Like, no one chooses to have a midwife, and um, whereas you left. Yeah, yeah. So, so the the, the um, it's, it's all yeah, the numbers. Home. The whole island is home. Yeah, it's just a big home here. Yeah, no, and and really, when we we were looking at Joey's study and looking at what they had to do to kind of bring in, you know, the, the midwives and the home births, I won't say that there there are none on Prince Edward Island, but it's it's not it's not a customary practice. Thank you. Can I um, can I can I jump in? I just have yes. in, in response to the question. So when you look at meconium in the legal database and some of the meconium cases, they actually have involved midwives, and I think that there's a positive obligation on some midwives practicing in Ontario to collect um, meconium, particularly if there's um, CAS involvement or if they're asked by by someone to collect it. Um, and uh, the other thing that I wanted to say is that. Um, Canada's a little bit different from the United States, but they've needed to anonymize um, results in many of the U.S. studies, particularly in the studies um, that have come from Hawaii, where they have a lot of methamphetamine exposure, because there's a positive obligation on physicians in that jurisdiction to report women to the state when they have a meth-exposed um, infant, which will result in the infant being separated from its mother, at least for a period of time. And so um, they have needed to construct that protection prior to engaging in the study in those jurisdictions. That's right. Here in, uh, in Canada, at least in Ontario, uh, where we're primarily work, there's no, uh, we don't assume that because mom's using drugs that the child is in danger. So that the physician's not under necessarily obligation. It's up to their own discretion if they, for example, for example suspect prenatal drug use as to what's the best way to address that in the best interests of their patients. So there's no automatic response. Stuart, we have one question here. Okay, uh, Dr. Bryan. Yeah, it's Tim Bryan from Queen's University. I've really learned a lot this afternoon, so thank you very much to all the presenters and all the people asking questions either uh, in the room here or via uh, the internet. Uh, my question would be for Prince Edward Island. Uh, do we have a handle on consumption of alcohol by the population as a whole and then what's happening with mom's 
uh, during pregnancy? Um, I don't know uh, that there are any numbers. I am going to be able to help me with, I guess what we're really tuned into right now is um, the opioid use. And, and the population is really sensitized by that problem and our uh, moms going on to methadone programs and then and the impact of those opioid addicted babies on our neonatal service, particularly because their, their admissions tend to be prolonged. So, so folks are sensitized because of that to the, um, to the whole issue of uh, drug effects in, in babies. Our concern is that it, it, it's, um, it's like a lot of things because alcohol is legal. That, that people assume that it's not as dangerous as it is, and we like to sensitize folks that way as well. I know I'm not really answering your question, but um, um, when I first came here, um, I worked with Joe Nansen in Saskatchewan, and Joe said, Kathy, you're going to Saskatchewan, or you're going to PEI. When I go to meetings and I ask about fetal alcohol and PEI, the folks from PEI say, well, we don't have that problem here. Yeah. And that was one of the reasons I became interested in this. Yeah, and well, this is a bit of a loaded question because I've actually been looking at the abstracts for uh, poster presentations at tomorrow's phase meeting, and there is a paper there that deals with mom's self-reporting of consumption of alcohol during pregnancy and the incidence of FASD in this province, and it's, uh, it's substantive in terms of the data that are presented. So I would encourage people to maybe have a look at that poster tomorrow, and it's not from my lab. <laughs> Maybe it has something to do with the peculiarities of islands. So uh, I think we saw on one of the slides that, uh, that uh, FASD and FAS don't exist in the UK, which I think is, a, I think is an island. <laughs> so, and probably, probably the same, uh, same mindset. Uh, I'm, uh, with your indulgence, there's just one more question online. And uh, in fairness, I'm going to pose it. I'm not sure it's easily answerable. But uh, the question is, how can we be sure that the motivation for requesting meconium testing uh, is to prove um, whether, uh, I'm not sure, the, the question isn't quite clear, uh, is the motivation to prove that the mom has substance involved and to remove her, her child from care, uh, or is there a reason to believe that the data is simply being put into the, the child's health file in case there's some later uh, worry about developmental delay uh, so that the test will be there to contribute to diagnosis. So in, I'm, I'm not sure this is an answerable question about people's motivation in ordering the test, but any, any comment as a final? Well, I think what we can say is the World Health Organization has guidelines on when screening is appropriate and when it's not. And I would hazard to guess that screening is not appropriate unless it's in the best interest of the mother and the baby, and we have effective interventions that can reduce the downstream impact of the early life exposure. But that's just Joey, did you have a comment? Uh, yes, so exactly that. It actually speaks to Dr. Mitsui's question before, uh, because uh, right now in clinical practice, uh, there's usually a clinical indication screen. It's up to the physician to uh, it's the physicians, and so all the physicians are trained on their ethical duty to their patients. So when we talk about alcohol, our primary goal uh, in, in developing and offering a screen is that downstream services are mobilized. In some cases, in clinical practice, the children are already in the care of the Children's Aid Society, <laughs> determining a substance abuse history uh, when unreliable self-reports are available is important in protecting the child towards the future. Um, but uh, Dr. Tuff is absolutely correct that the primary requirement if you're doing a universal screen, if you're doing a medical screening program, is you must have follow-up services and there must be an element of benefit to the child. So, uh, but the ethics depend on the practitioner. So if you have a good social worker, a good doctor, a good nurse that's involved. Um, Okay. I think this is another topic that we can revisit after the break. Uh, uh, I mean, it is uh, part of what we need to consider in formulating some recommendations. So I'm, uh, we, uh, for the people online, I think Doug may have a comment. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to let the people online know that, as uh, Dr. McLeod mentioned, that we are going to be taking a break now, and then the group in, uh, in person here in Southern Island is going to be coming back and doing, uh, having a little bit more discussion and drafting up some recommendations. Uh, so we are going to be ending the webinar now.
Uh, and I just want to thank everyone out there in the remote audience across the country for hanging in there. We, we had uh, uh, over 40 people and the vast majority, all but a couple hung on line throughout the entire session, so that was great. They obviously found the content informative because it's really easy to drop out of a webinar. You don't make any noise, you silently drift away, but everyone, everyone hung in there, which is, uh, I think, a testament to our great speakers and the great discussion that we just had. So uh, for the remote audience, uh, thank you again, and we'll be signing off the webinar right now. Oh, and uh, before you sign off, uh, one more thing. Uh, all of this uh, this session has been recorded and uh, will be posted on CAFC's Knowledge Exchange Network, which is at www.ken.cafc.org. That's C-E-N.cafc.org. Uh, so that will be uh, posted in the next uh, week or so. So if you want to go back and revisit any of the discussions that here or share it with your colleagues, etc., uh, please do so. Thanks again for coming. So obviously that information applies as well to everybody in the room. You don't need to harass the speakers about their slides. You'll be able to find them and include them in that, along with all the comments that uh, went, went with them. So we hope so we'll take a break for about 15 minutes. We really hope that uh, most of you or all of you will come back, uh, let's say, at uh, 5, to, 5 to 4, 10 to 4, 10, 10 to 4, uh, because tomorrow, as, as I'm sure you all know, tomorrow is the face meeting. Here and we are on the agenda to present some output from this uh, from this workshop, and, uh, and we'd like to have some recommendations that have your uh, your, your back. So uh, please uh, please return.